want to welcome you all to Wisdom from Our Neighborhood. In today's episode, uh, we're going to be talking about Chris Dalnock, Reflections on Violence Against Minority Community Groups. Um, my name is Terry Kylo. I'm the Executive Director of Paths to Understanding. Our mission is to bridge bias and build unity through multi-faith peacemaking. Before we begin, we want to offer a land acknowledgement that, uh, that all of us are currently standing on the traditional land of the, of the Coast Salish peoples, and we honor with gratitude the land itself and the Coast Salish people themselves. Tonight, I have with me, I'm so pleased um, to have J Rabbi Jim Morrell, who is my first guest ever, like what seems like about 18 years ago, but was only really about eight months ago. He's the Rabbi Emeritus of Temple B'nai Torah, and is currently rabbi at Bet Cherevim in South County, South King County. Rabbi Jim is a leader both locally and nationally in the interfaith movement, and how interfaith relationships are a key part, and, and interfaith relationships are a key part of his leadership as a rabbi. I'm also pleased to welcome tonight Jasmeet Singh, um, who's been a Washington State resident since 2007, excuse me, since 2002. He's the founder and board member of a national civil rights organization, the Sikh Coalition that was founded on the night of September 11th, 2001, in response to a torrent of violent attacks against sick Americans throughout the United States. Since then, the Sikh Coalition has, been, has transformed into the largest Sikh American advocacy and community development organization in the United States. He is also a founder of a Washington State nonprofit, the Khalsa Gurmat Center, that was firmly incorporated in 2014. Professionally, he's the chief technology officer and founder of Pix, Pixatel Systems. He's also the principal of the consulting firm eFlow Systems in Olympia, Washington, that has been working with different state agencies. And I'm Terry Kylo, the director of Pass to Understanding, and we're so glad all of you are joining us tonight. So Jim, um, can you please uh, give us an overview of what happened on what is known as Kristallnacht? Well, the reason why we're doing this program tonight is because this is the anniversary of Kristallnacht. In 1938, 82 years ago, and it was an event that you'll hear a little bit more about from a person who lived through it, through a video, but the Nazi party was in power from the early 1930s, and there were many restrictions and disabilities placed on the Jewish community over those few years from 1933 onward, but it was this event uh, November 9th in the evening through November 10th in the morning. Crystal not means the breaking of all the glass of the synagogues and Jewish places of worship and uh, violence, physical violence against the Jewish community, arrests of thousands of people. And a lot of people mark this as actually the beginning of the Holocaust in the sense that previously there while the disabilities were enforced and it was very difficult and prejudice was rampant. This was the first example of a state-sponsored violence against the entire Jewish community, mm -hmm. which led over the next um, seven years to the murder of six million Jews, not only in Germany, but throughout Europe under the Nazi regime. So it's a very, very significant and very painful moment in Jewish history, I would say in world history, and we do like to commemorate it because those who uh, forget will be uh, doomed to repeat. So thank you so much for asking me to be with you today, uh, Terry, and for re remembering this event. And there are many, many other commemorations throughout the world during the last 24 hours. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jim. And, you know, thinking about... Um about what happened during that time, you know, there was some international outcry, you know, but how did the Nazis explain what happened that night? Well, it, it was a f the fact that people did get the attention and they, they were focused on it, where perhaps they hadn't been before. Remember the Berlin Olympics and things, you know, there was people had diplomatic relationships with the Nazi regime. It was, it was Germany. And and people were uncomfortable with it, but there was a normalization. But this was the beginning where people saw this is a, a, uh, an evil empire, an evil empire. And so there was response, but sadly enough, not sufficient. 
to stop it at that time. And there were newspaper reports and it was widely publicized. And I think the, the government said, well, this was a spontaneous uprising, but it really wasn't. It was sponsored by the government and was put into place by the uh, paramilitary organizations that were really part of the government. And from that point on, being a Jew in Germany or being a Jew in, in Europe was really a sentence of death, as I said, for six million people. Perhaps it could have been stopped in a variety of ways, but sadly, tragically, it was not until the end of the war and the liberation of the camps, which we've also commemorated recently. So uh, people could read about it. They can go on Wikipedia, Kristallnacht, and uh, we do encourage people to learn about it. Fortunately, we do have in Seattle area, state of Washington, the Holocaust Center for Humanity and the video you'll show comes from that organization. I'm on the board. It's a organization that's dedicated not only to commemorating the Holocaust, but preventing future and similar uh, events throughout the world and against genocide and racial violence and hatred of any kind. So it's a, it's a wonderful organization and I'll encourage you to go visit those who are listening right in downtown Seattle. But, and the memories and the, uh, the survivors, and there are sadly, as if you can do the mathematics, there are not that many survivors who are still alive, go and speak through Zoom, but when they can in person to tell the story. So the, the byword in our Jewish community is do not forget which is a quotation from the book of Deuteronomy, do not forget. So I, I know that approximately 30,000 Jewish men um, were taken captive at that time and sent to concentration camps. And I, I'm wondering, you know, what effect did this have among the Jewish people in Germany? Just, just this whole like fast moving event and all these arrests, like what did that do among, among that population? And this is something that is so important what you just said, in retrospect, that 2020 vision that we have from the future to the past, you would have hoped that there would have been a more of an outcry by, by the German people. But in the Jewish community, there was various responses to it. Uh, the concentration camps, I would say at that time were really just uh, not, they were not death camps at that point. So people were arrested and some of them were released. And I think people did have hope, oh, this will this will pass. And that's a good lesson for us tonight. We can't simply say when things that are wrong happen, just be patient, it will pass. That was that was a mistake by some of the members of the Jewish community. Others took the took the signal very seriously and did try to emigrate and many of them did and or sent their children away. And there was attempts by Christians as well as Jews to speak up against the system. But by that time, it, it had taken hold of the, of the minds and hearts of the many of the German people, I can't say all, mm -hmm. and was moving inexorably towards what we know to be today the Holocaust. No one was killed on Crystal Knock. Uh, maybe uh, many were injured. There were there were attacks, but it it was a violent event, and the breaking of the glass was breaking of the hearts of the Jewish people, and I say the German people as well in retrospect, because too many people were silent. And I'm saying that in the Jewish community as well as the Christian community, too many people were silent. And also people who read about it in the newspaper in, in Britain and the United States also could have been more proactive. All this, of course, in retrospect. And if we were there, if you and I were there, Terry, who knows what we would have done? We, we can't say, would we have spoken up as you, as a Christian, I as a Jew, would we have recognized the, the inevitability of 
what was going to happen, I, I really don't know. But it's a tragic event, uh, the, the greatest tragedy in the history of the Jewish people, without any question, the Holocaust. And it's 82 years, it's not that long ago. It's still recent history. Yeah, I think so often, um, particularly among Christians, you know, we, we sort of, we, we think about this night, we think about the Holocaust in general, and we sort of put it onto the German people as if they were somehow uniquely susceptible to this. And, and of course, that is a way of remembering history while forgetting its lesson. And I, I think about, you know, the, the people that were bystanders that night who saw what was happening and who began to perhaps remove themselves from public conversation about what was right. Because when that kind of violence happens, people start to retreat to protect themselves, it seems, as well, because they can feel the violence coming. And uh, so I, I don't know how you respond to that, but- Well, I mean, you, you said it very well. And you have to remember it was, even though the, the Nazi party was put into uh, power through democracy, there was a democratic vote in the early 1930s. By that time, it became a pretty much a totalitarian government, very, very strong, uh, strong police force, uh, SS. So it, it was dangerous to speak up. There's no doubt about it. I and mean, it wasn't something that they, 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 much, much more could have been done, but there was definitely, you were at risk if you did speak up. So we have to recognize that we have to be careful about being too morally judgmental about what others did and did not do. I would also say that there were many in the Christian community who did stand up and did resist and suffer the consequences. We speak about uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and others who, who did speak up, Christian clergy, Protestant and Catholic. So we are, we're, we're in awe of those who have the moral courage to risk their lives to speak up for others. To speak up for yourself is also something that is, is admirable, but to speak up for others. And this is a lesson that we have to continue to learn every day uh, in our country and throughout the world. We cannot remain silent when injustice is uh, perpetrated on anyone. And I know that my, my brother from the Sikh community will speak about that as well. And they have a story to tell, which is probably not as well known as our story because we are here in the Western world and that was from the, an Eastern world, but there's a lesson to be learned for all of us. And genocide is sadly not that uncommon in the history of the human species. The Holocaust is our, is our tragedy but it's a, it's a universal tragedy. And we, that's why I really appreciate you and Path to Understanding really being part of the process of trying to educate and reduce the amount of prejudice and lead to really a place where we really are one world. It's a long journey. Well, let's, let's listen for a minute to Eva. I'll share my screen here, friends. And and then we'll, uh, we'll watch this brief, like basically almost a two minute video. Here we go. My father was a highly respected music and drama critic in Berlin at the time. And uh, very early on, namely in 1933, right when Hitler uh, took over, he was uh, let go from the newspaper to, on which he worked at the time. A at the time, I was going to through this particular right. place, Fer uh, Oliva Platz, yeah, and uh, and there I come see suddenly these yellow benches for Juden in big bold letters, and then there was another incident namely in a nearby on the Kurfürstendamm, which was a very elegant street in Berlin, uh, were glass encased billboards with great big things of caricatures of what a Jew is supposed to look like. And 
um, on the Sturmer at Nazi newspaper. So you came upon these great big things. Horror, really, at something so gross. I couldn't name it as yet, but just seeing it was one more manifestation. But I, again, I was so young, so I couldn't put it really quite together and ran away from that. So we want to we want to thank the the Holocaust Center for Humanity for for that video and for sharing that with us and uh, we um, I want to I want to move on now you know and without diminishing that video let's 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 move on and talk Jasmeet about the program that took place against the Sikh community um, in 1984 in India and could you tell us what happened there. Thank you, Terry. Uh, first of all, I'm really humbled to be here today. Uh, thank you, R Rabbi Jim. Uh, I mean, the, the story that you shared, I was listening to it, and it was so vivid in how I related to some of the things that I've experienced as a Sikh. Um, and, you know, I still remember that uh, those days in October and November uh, 1984 that we are really talking about out here 36 years ago. I was a 16 year old, uh, you know, in Delhi, and I got to experience what uh, pogroms really mean, what genocide of a community really means. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, throughout the country, uh, throughout India, uh, that was my, uh, you know, love, my land uh, from North India all the way to the South India. Uh, you know, it was a carnage as far as the Sikhs were concerned. Uh, it was most organized in Delhi because that's where uh, Indira Gandhi, the then prime minister, had been assassinated. And so on October 31st, we started getting the news. And, uh, you know, as, as the days progressed, the next three days, uh, there were thousands of Sikhs who were either killed or they were butchered, uh, you know, tires put in their uh, necks, uh, burnt alive. Uh, there were women who were gang raped. Uh, there were sisters who were molested. Uh, so it was a gruesome, gruesome time for us. Uh, Sikh institutions destroyed, Gurdwaras destroyed, uh, just like you were talking about the glass shattering. Uh, we saw all our institutions basically uh, laid to waste. Uh, we saw the businesses, the houses being basically burnt with people inside uh, or, you know, um, I think what was really, really, uh, you know, brings it home is that six who were traveling anywhere, whether they were in buses, they were in trains, they were in cars, they never made it home. So you had parents, you had, you know, kids who were waiting for their parents to come and they never came back home, right? So when I think about those days, uh, it's such a, such a hole in my heart, right? For a country that I loved, uh, that that is what happened uh, to an innocent, a community that had to suffer, uh, you know, and it was all uh, being driven by a state-sponsored genocide, right? Where the whole notion was, let's teach them a lesson, right? Let's, let's teach them a lesson that they'll never forget. So whether it was the businesses, the six were known as industrialists. So they owned a lot of, uh, you know, industries. They had, uh, they had the travel uh, sort of, uh, you know, trucks and buses and uh, taxis and everything. So everything was laid to waste in those three days while the entire state apparatus just stood by and watched uh, the six burn. Uh, no one, no one from the administration really stood up and said, we need to stop this. What was really, I think, troubling in my mind at that time was, um, it was like, uh, there was absolute uh, silence, right? And the silence was permeated with this uh, images or videos that were being flashed in the state media, uh, which was about that, uh, you know, uh, khun ka badla khun, which basically means uh, we will avenge the blood with blood. So you can imagine the state-sponsored media playing that over and over again, 24-7, uh, while this carnage is going out uh, all around cities, and especially in Delhi and around Delhi, Kanpur, Bokaro, and a lot of other cities 
uh, across uh, across India. So when you were talking about that, I could uh, I was reliving what I had uh, experienced as a 16 year old uh, sitting along with my friend on the roof of my house and watching the entire city burn in all directions. So it was a very poignant moment for me just listening to you uh, share that memory. You know, what this, uh, what this gets me thinking about, uh, brothers, is not just the violent event, but the conditions that, that make it possible. And um, what were some of the, the, the racial and religious messaging in India about six before that event happened? So there was a very essential narrative that had been uh, played into the public mind, right? And that narrative was about that uh, the six are really separatist. They are trying to divide India, right? So that kind of created that sense that rather than six speaking up and asking for justice or rights, uh, whether it was regional rights or more, uh, you know, uh, freedom under the democratic institutions, uh, it was being twisted in a format where they were the villains, right? They were the ones, uh, they were otherized. You know, it becomes easy to target a community when you otherize them and make them uh, the target of the majority and say, these are the bad guys. And that's exactly what started happening before the events of 1984. Yeah, so that, that process of <clears throat> dangerous speech, it's called today in the academic uh, sort of study of, of genocide, um, you know, it, it begins with uh, an us and a them, and it begins with so some sort of notion of, of, you know, sort of images of dehumanization that moves on uh, to uh, proposing that violence is necessary, if unfortunate, but it's necessary and even heroic in order to protect vulnerable people, in order to protect our culture. And then it, 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 it so what happens is it, is that narrative turns otherwise good intent, well-intended people to a situation where they feel like violence is necessary and even heroic and must be done to protect their children and the future of their, of their community. And that's the danger of that kind of moment. And we know, um, I, you know I think you know, from the excellent work that's been done historically around Kristallnacht and, and the, the Holocaust, that those conditions were being intentionally created in Germany as well, which then, of course, you know, leads us to to today. Um, but I'm forecasting a, a question that's going to come in just a bit. So, what impact did this moment have on on Sikh uh, uh, residents in India? Like, like, how did this how did this impact everybody? I think the first thing is really feeling um, like you don't count. Right, I mean, your sense of worth in a society basically gets diminished. Uh, that's the essential part. And I think, you know, whether you were an adult, whether you were a young person, just like I was, or you were born, you know, very newly born, or you were born after 1984, it has actually shaped who we've become as a community because we've come to empathize with others, when they have to go through similar things, we feel we need to speak up. When the same thing happened in Gujarat uh, in 2002, uh, we felt compelled that we need to speak up. Even now, when things happen around the world, we feel as six, even though we are very small as a community, we have the voice to stand up and speak up. And I think that's the essential thing, if anything, that I've taken up taken away from that experience that if others did not stand up for me, I have to stand up for other communities when I see something wrong happen. And that's very much the sense, Rabbi Jim, that I, I get from rabbis. And every time I meet a Jewish person in the, in the street or in a meeting, I mean, that's very much the sense that I hear from my Jewish sisters and brothers about wanting to stand up and, and, and speak out for and on behalf of people that are under this kind of pressure. That is the ideal and I, I hope that we do it. I hope that we will continue to do it. And it's not always easy, 
the one thing of what happened in, in Nazi Germany is the dehumanization of the Jew. It wasn't simply that the Jews were enemies of the state, but they really were seen as a different race, a, a inferior race that must be eliminated. And that, of course, is the ultimate uh, prejudice and uh, racism where you become less than human. And sadly, you know, both of you, that that was the way that Native Americans were often looked upon in our own country, that they were less less than fully human. And, and Africans also came here as slaves. They were not considered to be fully human. And when you see human beings and you treat them something that's totally other and less, and you say these people are not really part of our, our human world, that is when we have, when genocide becomes maybe inevitable. And so it was, it was a theory that was uh, of an evil theory. We say, you know, we blame Hitler. He wrote the Mein Kampf, the book that got it going. He became the chancellor, he became the leader, but it, it, it permeated the society. So it wasn't just that you were, you were bad, but you were absolutely other and not worthy of being alive. And that's, that's, that is a great tragedy. And we can't let that happen to any other group. Uh, racial, religious, cannot let that happen. We have to speak up. And that, that's what does happen. Six people, well, they, they were part of India and Pakistan for, for you know, since their inception, they, they go back. They were not in any way different, but they were portrayed as the enemies. And that's something that, um, again, we have to be part of, yeah. of speaking up at our peril, our own peril, never again, never let happen again. Yeah, I, and I think the thing that, that just keeps being impressed on me and the work that I do in the conversations I have around the state is to remind people and remind myself that most of the people that participate in genocide, and, and let's be clear, in the last century, 262 million people were killed in genocides. Um, most of the people who did the killing were not intending to do evil. They were persuaded that that killing was, a, was some form of good, many of them. Yes. And that's a vulnerability that, that, that is true of all human beings. We can all be fooled in this way. Uh, and and it's, it's very insidious and it, it works on us. And I think, you know, in this country, we've seen a 35% increase in attacks on people and their places of worship and prayer from 2014 to 2018, according to the FBI. Um, what is it about what's happening in America that's causing this to happen? And Rabbi Jim, I'd like to start with you. There's no doubt about there's been an increase in these kinds of crimes, and it's been well documented documented by the FBI, the Anti-Defamation League, and others. And it's really hard to say, you know, I don't want to make it too facile why this is happening or put the blame on, on one group or the other. It's, it's both right wing and left wing. It's, it permeates. I think it's um, people feel insecure. They feel insecure about themselves, about their place in society, and um, we can understand and maybe even empathize a little bit with the way that they feel. But we have to also say this is absolutely unacceptable. This is not the correct response. Um, and we have to try to it's educate, but it's, it's really grassroots. And that's what you're doing with your wonderful organization. You're speaking in the grassroots, going to the churches, going to the synagogue, going to the mosque, going to the town meetings and saying, let's talk about what you're feeling. And if you're feeling insecure, let's talk about that and talk about why. I'm not gonna put the blame on any person or any movement, that, that's not who I am. But we have to realize that something is happening and we have to, we have to change direction. Jasmeet, anything you wanna say about, you know, why these kinds of attacks are increasing in the country at this point? I often think about like words are everything right, words and how you frame things 
um, make a tremendous difference in terms of how people perceive things. And I think there is a responsibility that comes with public office. And I feel like that is what I want to have, uh, you know, most of the people who are holding public office or are in positions of power accountable to say your words mean something to the communities that you are advocating for. So when you say something that should come out of your heart, that should come out with the sense that you want the welfare of all people. Right. And that is what I feel, you know, not trying to transfer blame, but I think there's a huge responsibility that comes with that position of authority, position of responsibility, position that basically is there to provide justice to all people. Right. So, and I feel that that framing, whether it is by media, whether it's by people uh, who are in power, is extremely important to shape how the society really uh, moves with all parts of the society, right? Whether it is the African American community today or the Hispanic community that feels targeted. I think that's a very important element of how we say things, how do we frame them? You know, when I when I was doing presentations across the state back in the in the before time when we got together, you know, I, I would use this simple uh, formula. Uh, scarcity plus bias times dehumanization equals violence. And, uh, and that was a simple way to put together a really complex you know, set of notions. And it, it seems strange to people that the United States is one of the most wealthy countries. But if, you, if, if we look at the economic data and the, the, the wealth and income disparity between the top 0.1% and the bottom 50% or the bottom 90% really, um, you can see that a lot of people are feeling like they don't have a future, they don't have a place. And they're part of a society where particularly white people were supposed to have, you know, first place in, in everything. And then I, I reflected upon uh, Irvin Staub's work, you know, about, about how dehumanization works and how genocide take place. And he mentioned that in his studies, uh, it, it often happens in cultures that have both a sense of superiority toward other, other cultures and other countries, but also at the same time feels persecuted, feels like somebody's trying to take our stuff, somebody's trying to you know, remove our cheese, you know? And then on and underneath that, then a history of racial and religious bigotry, which sort of forms the historical root of, of a lot of it. Um, and then, and then you know, what, what begins to happen um, is, is, is you add the sense of scarcity to it. And then all that together with the right kind of leadership or the wrong kind of leadership can then lead to this kind of violence. But he points out that in cases across the world, communities that had active bystanders, folk that weren't part of the targeted community who stood up and said no, or said, hey, wait a minute, are we sure we wanna do this? Do we realize what we're doing? That the, early, the earlier those folk began to stand up and be active, the less likely it was that genocide would take place or that it would be widespread. And so I, as I look at our country, I see all of those elements present. Maybe not dominant exactly yet, but very much present and active, and especially in reflecting on this current you know, election. So I'm, I'm, very, I'm very concerned myself about that we have a lot of the, the, the makings um, of, of this kind of violence right now. Um, I don't know, what do you, how do you respond to that, Jasmine? I, you know, I, I struggle with that too, right? I struggle with it because I look at some of the economic disparities that exist in all communities, right? And then, uh, you know, people playing on those insecurities, like the rabbi said that, you know, a lot of times that people find those pockets of insecurities to really play on and try to uh, you know, find things that sort of create the ugliness that comes with it, right? And I feel that happening more and more often. It's not like uh, there are not parts of this country that are economically deprived, uh, right? And across different communities, you know, it, it's not a matter of race, it's not a matter of religion, it is, but those are exactly the communities that become vulnerable to the kind of demagoguery that I see sometimes happening in public space. Uh, mm -hmm. If anything, I think, you know, in the last four years or more, uh, we've normalized that conversation, 
uh, that was not something that was acceptable in the public realm. Mm -hmm. uh, yet I've seen more and more of that ugliness becoming prevalent. So I feel uh, concerned about it, right? Or more than concerned about it because my feeling is that you have to counteract that. You have to speak up, you have to counteract, not trying to, again, uh, you know, um, an eye for an eye is not going to take you anywhere, right? So it has to be uh, with compassion, with understanding and with education, right? How do you change those perceptions that have been created to divide a nation, right? If anything, I feel our nation is so divided today, more than ever that I can imagine, uh, you know, in the last two decades that I've seen uh, politically, right? And I think there's a time now to heal that, to bring the different communities together. I agree. And I really appreciate what you say. One thing that I would recommend to you, Terry, to do with your organization, which is a wonderful organization, there were 76 million people who voted for Biden and there's 70 million people who voted for Trump. Yeah. It would be great if on a one-to-one -one basis, a Biden voter and a Trump voter one-on-one -on -one would sit down with each other and talk about what, why they voted the way they did, what their concerns were, and to really see that there, the humanity in both and really to understand what the, why th this country is so divided. And I think they would find out that really they have more in common than they realize. They both want the best for their family and for themselves and for the country, but they have a different vision. If we talk to each other, I don't know if you can get 70 million people together. Terry, maybe start with seven people. <laughs> but one Biden voter and one Trump voter sitting in the same room or in the same Zoom call and just say, what was your motivation? Why did you, why did you make that vote? What was your feeling? And I think that would be a way of beginning the healing. I, I, I did like what Joe Biden said it's a time for healing but the question is how we how we do the healing so that's that's my prayer tonight yeah i th i think i've been thinking a lot this last week about the role of of uh, of talk radio you know i'm from a very small town and the only radio stations you can find out there um carry talk radio mostly from a a, a very conservative point of view and then when you listen to those radio stations there, there really has been a systemic demonization of people on the left, as well as people of color and people of other religious traditions on those shows. And I think, you know, what, what's been occurring to me recently is that what we would recognize as a as dangerous speech toward our Muslim neighbors or our Sikh neighbors or our Jewish neighbors or, you know, any other uh, Buddhist neighbors, indigenous neighbors, what we would recognize as you know, dangerous speech toward them, we somehow excuse in the political realm. And, uh, and but I, I also, when I, when I try to speak, I, I also try to call progressives into account for the way in which they seem to think that because they have a snappy response doesn't mean they win the argument and winning an argument doesn't win a heart and, and it's, it's more about relationship and respect. And sometimes there's a lack of respect for people in rural, er, rural, rural areas on the part of some progressives or people who have a high school education on the part of some. And, and that kind of smarty pants sort of attitude does not help in this moment. And so I often try to go out and speak to both sides and help people to see understand each other better. And I'll sometimes have progressives walk up to me angry that I didn't just come out and blast those racists over there. And then I asked them, well, what good does it do to simply walk up to someone and say that they're a racist, right? We have to work on having a conversation first. And I think a lot of times, you know, folk want a pretty quick, quick fix to this, and this is not going to be a quick fix. Oh. I think uh, one of the things that comes to my mind is, uh, you know, South Africa, when Desmond Tutu uh, actually sat down with people from the different races and really had a reconciliation commission, right? And I think we need to start having those kinds of conversations in our communities, right? It's not going to bring any good in case this divide keeps on increasing over a period of time, right? We need to have people who can cross that bridge and say, you know what, we need to settle down, we need to sit down, we need to have those honest conversations about what 
you know, troubles us, what ails our heart, and really figure out how do we fix this, mm -hmm. right? And my feeling is it's not that difficult, right? Just like what you said just now, right? You have to have that balance of how do you bring together? Don't try to uh, be over smart or try to uh, talk down to people, but really extend your hand to say, you know what, I come here in the spirit of really understanding what your perceptions are. And I think there are a lot of good people who want to be able to do that. So um, if we think about this violence that's taking place in the United States right now toward um, minority communities um, of faith, particularly, um, you know, how, how is, is this impacting them right now? Um, how, are they how are they responding to the violence when it happens to them? Rabbi, what do you think? Well, I think that there's a sense, you know, you do get a sense of uh, paranoia because you feel that you're in danger. And the last thing that I've seen over the last, and it's not just the last four years, it's really much more than that, but over the last several years, and I do want to remind everyone, or perhaps if they don't know about it, that in 2006, we had an attack on our Jewish community right. at the Jewish Federation, where one of our leaders uh, and a very dear friend of mine, Pamela Wecta, was murdered. Yes. So we're talking, we're talking about, you know, not just broken glass now. We're talking about actual people being attacked, murdered. And it's a rarity, but it's but it's still still very painful and it reverberates. So since that time and since not, and 9-11, we can't deny that that was a big turning point in our history as well. There's been much more sense of uh, need for security. And a lot of people don't understand that, that virtually every synagogue has a armed guard in front of it. I mean, as when people enter, that wasn't true when I was growing up in the 1950s and 1960s. It, it was, there was certainly anti-Semitism. We never felt there was any danger walking into our, our temple at that time. And now that's just, that's the way of the world. So people, I don't say they overreact, but they react and say, we need to be protected. And so I'm sure that's true in a, a Sikh temple, a mosque, any group that they feel that they might be attacked, they, they, they take precautions and it's not a comfortable way to live. We don't want to be living in, you know, behind barricades, but that's really what's happened. Again, I don't want to say it's just the last four years, much deeper than that, but, but uh, it's true, as my brother said, that if people in positions of authority speak in a certain way, it exacerbates the problem. So uh, I don't want to get political, but I hope that we're looking towards reconciliation and healing, but it has to be mutual respect. And the vast majority, 99.9% .9 of Americans are not violent, are not trying to kill people, are not doing it. But it's this, it's this small, small, but very significant minority on the left and the right that pose a threat. And there's also many more who harbored in their hearts. So it's, 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 we're living in that kind of world. We can talk about uh, gun control. We can talk about a lot of other things that might be part of the solution, but the real solution is changing the hearts and minds of people. And that's where Terry, you know, you're dedicating your life to trying to do that. And I give you a lot of cr a credit for doing that. And I, I feel that we all, we're all in this together. Jasmine, how about you? How, are, how do you think communities are responding to this sense of violence that's taking place? I think, uh, you know, I concur. Uh, there's that feeling of uh, fear, the terror that builds into a community. I can tell you after the shooting in Kent uh, yeah. that happened a few years back, uh, you know, older parents, older grandparents who used to go out for walks were no longer doing that. They would not go and sit in the uh, gardens like they used to. They would go and sit on a bench in uh, in the neighborhood park. They wouldn't do that, right? So that 
you know, but ultimately you get used to your life again and life goes on. That's just a natural part of being human beings who we are. Uh, but there is definitely that frustration. And I actually agree. This is actually not a recent thing. This is not something that has happened in four years. Yeah. It's actually, you know, from 9-11, we've seen an increase of uh, incidents against Sikhs, Muslims, uh, you know, the Jewish community and others, South Asians, right? People who are either misidentified as being Muslims or something, right? So there's Islamophobia that has really risen over the last years that we have to acknowledge, right? And that that is a real thing uh, that exists in our communities. Uh, and those things are real, right? You know, somebody walks into a Gurdwara in Milwaukee and then kills six, uh, six uh, worshippers uh, in, in that Gurdwara while they were praying. So that is a real thing, right? Those families lost a loved one on that day. Uh, similarly, somebody walks into uh, a, a black church uh, and then kills a whole bunch of people who are praying out there. These are real things, right? So there's, there's an element that comes with it that is very demoralizing to a community, right? And it takes a lot of people standing shoulder to shoulder with them to say, we stand with you, we acknowledge this is wrong, and we support you in this hour of grief. I saw that outpouring when it happened. And so many people, it happened in Wisconsin. I'm sorry, I use the word uh, Milwaukee, uh, Wisconsin. And I saw an outpouring of love where different communities came to the Gurdwara and stood with us and said, you know, we are standing with you here today. And I've seen that again and again and again. And I think that actually speaks to the 99.9% .9 of the people who have that good in their heart, who want to do the right things, right? But don't get enough time, unfortunately, to express that, right? But their showing up in the hour of need of a community is very, very meaningful. Well, I think yeah, I that, that. Beautiful, so beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I think that um, one of the key lessons of the last, the last beautiful experiences I've had in the last four or five years has been precisely those moments of terror and grief. And then all of a sudden, everybody else shows up. And, and the, the, the feeling, the outpouring of love and the sense of compassion and unity, it's not only important for the community that's been infected by the most recent problem, but it also humanizes all the other communities that show up. Because now all of a sudden, you're not just worried about your own community. You're worried about all the communities. Mm -hmm. which gets us back, I think, to some of the positive American values that we need to build on during this time, uh, which include freedom of religion. And, and you know, the, the, the freedom of, of religion includes the fact that other people are, are going to have other religions that you don't agree with. <laughs> and yeah. we need to learn to stand with each other, um, even when we don't agree about everything. And, but I think we're having a hard time doing that right now. And part of that is the whole notion of Christian supremacy that has been baked into the cake of so much Christianity in this country. And I think we've got a long ways to go to even recognize the way that sort of sense of Christian supremacy has worked its way into our theology, into our songs, uh, into the, the worship services that we do, into some assumptions that we have. Because, you know, as I try to tell people, God's love is big enough for everyone. You don't have to fight over that. <laughs> so how can we stand together, friends, in the face of, of this rising, you know, white, white supremacy and white nationalism in this nation? What kind of things do we need to do, Jim? What do you think? Well, I think that we've talked about them to this point. Now, the white nationalism, again, is a very, very small very small minority and uh, they've, they've been vocal it goes back to you know to the civil war ku klux klan and perhaps was more prevalent in those in in the past now it's really a, it's a fringe group fringe group that is very dangerous however and the people who use that kind of language they might base it on christianity but it's a perverted form of christianity and i'm 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 a great lover of Christianity, so I don't want to put too much on the history of Christianity as being responsible for it. 
Yeah. But these 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 individuals have to be totally put on the periphery, and we and I, you know the FBI is looking at, into it. They're they're on top of it. It's not a large group of people, but people who who promote violence as they, their solution to their problems. Who talk about white nationalism, white supremacy in a very explicit way. Now, maybe all white people have to work on racism. We all do. I'm, I, I'm white and I have to say that that's part of my legacy. But the people who advocate violence against people of other races, particularly among blacks, that's something that's really, uh, it's really has to do with criminal behavior. And it's, it has to be responded to in, in a, through law enforcement and we have to support it. Of course, that means a strong national government but a compassionate national government. But uh, I have to say, I've been impressed over the years about the Federal Bureau of Investigation being on top of these things. And we have to support them. And we have to speak up. And we have to say that this is not acceptable. This is not American. This is not who we are. And whether it's, you know, whether it's one person or two people or a small group of people, that has to be totally outside the realm of what of what's acceptable. And again, the people in the top, the people in government have to condemn it without any question. There'd be no question, this is unacceptable. And I've, I can understand why people have been critical of our president, President Trump, for not being able to speak up against it for whatever reason. And that will be a, a very, very uh, negative mark on his presidency. There's absolutely no question about it. But it's not just one person. And it's not just one. It's all of us speaking up unequivocally. This is not acceptable. And we have to, we have to arrest those who, who advocate who do who are violent. So it's, not, it's something, it's, it's a challenge white supremacy of that kind, white nationalism, separatism, you know, in the, in the Ku Klux Klan uh, mold, we have to, that's something that we all have to work on. That's a small group. There's larger problems as well that also have to be addressed. Now, Jasmine, what do you have to say? I think, uh, you know, I agree. I think part of it is uh, just strengthening uh, the tools that are available to law enforcement and to the prosecutors to be able to deal with uh, incidents of bias, hate, uh, you know, as we saw in, uh, and you were there, Terry, when uh, the Sikh was assaulted in Bellingham and how the prosecutor took, uh, you know, uh, action very quickly. And that was very heartening to the community to see action happen is much better than words, right? Words can fall uh, you know, can be flat or can be empty, but when there's concrete action that follows through, when something wrong happens in our communities, that's very, very important for us to see. The other thing is really um, creating that space, whether it is in our schools, whether it is in our workspaces, to really start having those dialogues, right? Why is it that we can't create a space where we can start sharing, uh, you know, our thoughts uh, and I understand, you know, but if we say this hour is allocated as a safe space, you can say things, you can express your thoughts, but really be able to encourage others to be able to express what they're feeling. Uh, the other uh, thing I feel is uh, telling stories and listening to stories, right? Uh, in my mind, uh, creating shared experiences is extremely important to understand people. So until unless we invest our time to telling stories about uh, human beings so that we can relate to their experiences, understand the struggles of a father who lost a son or a child uh, because of bias violence or somebody who lost, that's what is going to bring us together as a community, right? So I feel those are very important parts of what we need to start doing. You know, I think the thing that's, uh... The, the one thing I would I would say maybe maybe I, I want to add is that a couple of sociologists have been doing some work actually a whole bunch of them saying that about 27 percent of the population is is pretty open to the idea of a, a white nationalist state or a Christian nationalist state 
that, and that there's another like set of like 20% or so that are sort of friendly to it, but wouldn't want to go that far, right? And, and so I think we have to understand that, that, that somewhere around 40% of our population or so have some kind of authoritarian leaning. And we have to recognize that in our strategy moving forward. But the reality is that most of those people are not like super hardened folk that intend violence, right? They may sort of enable it. They may not worry about it too much, but, but they're not actively asking for it. And I think here we can go back again to some of the founding documents of this country that are, while never fully lived out, still are aspirational and are held by most Americans, uh, which is that we are fundamentally the people together and that we're in this together and that um, we have some of these freedoms. And one of those freedoms is to be different. And that part of our strength as a nation is being willing to stand up with each other and, and protect our differences so that my rights and your rights are both protected. And I think that's, that's a powerful asset that we have in this country, that we have these founding aspirational documents, which are not perfect, but which do give us some ground on which to speak to people. And I think the other piece is that all three of our faith traditions here are monotheistic traditions. They, we, we believe that there is one creator and that therefore there is an essential unity in the human family, even if we also compete sometimes. And that in that competition, we have to love ourselves and our neighbor so that we can have strong neighborhoods and communities. And so I think we have more to offer theologically as well um, in this conversation, as well as, as in that kind of human and civil rights area. So I, I just, I'm wondering what you all think um, our listeners can do if they, if they were to just pick one thing, you know, in the next couple of weeks to do, uh, to sort of begin to take their small leadership and you know, do what, what they can do uh, to counter this, the you know this sort of dehumanization that's happening, and and to help build a better world, what would be your your one uh, suggestion, Jasmine? I would say reach out. Right, a lot of times uh, we are driven by our fears, right? Fear of the people that we don't know anything about, you know. So if it is something that you are afraid of, like when you see someone and you don't know them, so you're making some judgment about who they are you know, that may be a, a learning opportunity, right? Reach out to them, speak to them, ask them something about themselves, right? And I think that's the easiest way that all of us can do uh, to connect with others. So in my mind, if there was one thing that I would say, I would say, reach out to the person that you would otherwise not reach out to. Jim, how about you? Well, I, I believe in the strength of organizations as kind of the bedrock of our community. And these are the uh, gathering places, our religious organizations and the organizations like you have. I think people need to come together and work in, in concert with each other. So important to have these kinds of organizations and have community that we, that we work together. And um, I, know I will give you a plug because what you're doing, and I have to remember my wonderful mentors, Rabbi Levine and Father Tracy, God, God bless them both. Father Tracy, I just spoke to recently, yeah. uh, well over 100 years old, going strong, mm -hmm. and the memory of Rabbi Levine who, who pa passed away uh, 35 years ago, but still so present in, in, our, in my heart. These are two people who made a lifetime and a commitment of working together and uh, speaking to each other. And, and that, was, that was such a great, great mo uh, role model when they came together. And uh, it still reverberates after all these years. So we need heroes like that to uh, inspire us and, and give us away. But the thing about what they did was they just sim sim simply have a television program challenge and talk to each other. But what they did was say, we need to have a gathering place. So they created Camp Brotherhood. And that was, that was a radical thing. And so we're gonna have a camp dedicated to people 
living together for a few days, a few weeks, and such a great, great thing that they were able to accomplish. So, you know, it's one thing to talk about it on TV, but if we live it out yeah. in a in a place where we actually physically come together. So I love the that common ground, finding that common ground where we really sit down together. And now it's probably through Zoom, but there'll be another, there'll be a day when we'll sit down in the same room and talk and mm -hmm. gather people of different backgrounds together. I, you know, the, the Sikh uh, community, 25 million strong throughout the world, the Jewish community, 15 million, very small communities. But we feel that we have, we have some to, to uh, contribute to the, to the mix. So I'm so, so grateful that the Sikh community is now part of our American fiber and uh, all the other minority groups in, in like the Jewish group, Muslim. We're, it's one, I mean, when I said the Pledge of Allegiance when I was a kid growing up, you know, one nation under God, indivisible, yes. with liberty and justice for all, I'll never forget that, but indivisible, one nation. Wow, and it's that's something we have to we have to to work on. It's something we can't take for granted. Yes. It's an ongoing process. But uh, I I feel that we're I personally am an optimistic person. I think we're definitely going in the right direction. We can talk about the things that aren't right, and we should and speak up when they're not right. But look at all the good things that are happening in our world, and be so grateful. And that's part of being a person of faith that we're so yeah. grateful to God, our common God, who uh, gives us these opportunities like we're having today. It's such a blessing. So thank you. Thank you, Jasmine, for being here. Thank you, uh, Terry, my, my brother, my both my brothers. And I hope that we're going in the right direction. Uh, I hope that I'm, 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 we're standing on the shoulders of all those who went before us and give our regards to Father Tracy. I know you speak to him recently, uh, very often. I and uh, I was really glad I was able to speak to him over the phone recently. It's been a while. And he, he's he's going strong, but we have some great mo role models out there. Well, you know, part of what I do when I go visit him, I know we're going a little bit over time, but that's, that's all right. I, I go out and visit him and I listen for the way he and the rabbi try to listen deeply to the moment that they were in. And to think strategically about what they could do to help keep sewing us together again, to help mm -hmm. keep us recognizing the essential unity we already have and that we're just forgetting about. And so that the TV show is part of that. Their speaking tours were part of that. Um, but they recognized that wisdom communities were not ready to come together publicly yet. So they, they built a youth camp and mm -hmm. they did that for a while. And then today, you know, what's been on my mind is looking at the, elect the electoral map and the counties that were red and the counties that were blue. And how can Paths to Understanding start to equip people in places where there have, has been no interfaith conversation? How can we help leaders in those communities start to gain some strength and gain some vision and then get connected to the next larger city that has something like that going on? And then bring some of the folk from that the other city to come and have relationship in some of those small towns. Because as a kid, I thought the Catholics were just crazy. And I was Lutheran, right? You know, so you just don't meet anybody when you're out there. But I know small town people, when you meet somebody, you start to love them. And that's why I got to kind of love what you said, Jasmine, too, about we need to start, we need to continue to learn from people from about people from them. Mm -hmm and not about them from third parties that are maybe maybe not tr maybe trying to make us forget the indivisibility of the human species and the human race right so um i just so appreciate this this gift and this blessing to be with both of you today i respect both of you so very much and we're just so grateful for all the work that you do thank you terry thank you really appreciate it this was wonderful and i really want to thank both of you for your words of wisdom um, really, really appreciate your time. Thank you. And my feelings are the same. It's just a blessing. And it's great to be with the two of you. When I see your face, Jasmine, I, I see the face of God. And uh, Terry, you've been a good friend. So let's keep it going. Amen. Amen. And to all of you who watch tonight or, or watching uh, on video sometime later, a uh, farewell and we'll see you next time. You can learn more about our organization at paths to understanding.org. 
Um, we encourage you to be well, be calm, and be good to your neighbors. Thank you so much.